In the last chapter, we spent a little bit of time considering how for each ion, the concentration inside the cell versus outside the cell might be different. And we said that the combined effects of all of those ion uh, concentration differences ends up leading to a resting membrane potential. And we said that in general, the resting membrane potential is going to be negative for cells, and particularly for neurons, this is the type of cell that we're gonna be focused in on for this, uh, for this next section here. The resting membrane potential for a neuron is minus 70 millivolts. That'll be a number that you'll definitely want to know. So at rest, neurons have a negative membrane potential. And that goes along with the fact that, um, that the cells tend to have more positive charges outside than they do inside. And that's for a number of different reasons. For one, just the sodium potassium pumps that we've learned about. Remember, what they're doing all the time is they're transporting two potassiums into the cell and three sodiums out of the cell. So they're transporting more positive charge out than they are positive charge in. So this helps to contribute to that imbalance of charges. So given that this is the normal resting value for neurons. What we're gonna be doing is considering deviations from this value. It turns out that neurons are very excitable. We say that they are um, excitable cells or irritable cells. And uh, what this word means is that they are capable of changing their resting membrane potential and they can do it really fast. The way that this can happen is by altering how permeable the membrane is to very specific ions. So remember each type of ion may have its own special channel across the plasma membrane. And so if the cell can just selectively open some of those channels, but not others, then that would be one way to alter um, the membrane potential. So tying this all back in with what we considered in the last chapter, remember we did a, we learned to do a calculation for each specific ion. We used the Nernst equation and calculated the equilibrium potential. Okay, so uh, anytime a cell opens a specific channel, like for a specific ion, what's going to happen is that ion will move down its own gradient. We said that it moves down its electrochemical gradient. And what this is referring to is the fact that there are two sort of driving forces that cause ions to move. There's the concentration gradient, the chemical gradient, that just depends on concentration differences between two locations. So that's the same concept as diffusion. But there's also, since we're talking about ions, there are also charges to consider. So there's an electrical gradient that might come into play. Um, positive charges like to move to where negatives are at, and um, positive charges like to move away from other positive charges. So those sorts of considerations all end up getting balanced and all put together, we call it um, an electrochemical gradient. So we say that ions will follow their electrochemical gradient, meaning they'll move down, they'll move in whatever direction is appropriate based on the balance of those forces. There's a little bit of terminology that we're just going to take a moment and introduce. We're going to be using these words as we move forward in this context. And um, coming back to, to the, this number again, the resting membrane potential for a neuron is minus 70 millivolts. Okay, so what this is saying is that there's a difference. There's a difference inside the cell versus outside of the cell. And so we say that at rest, a neuron is polarized. Okay, it's polarized. It's different inside than it is outside. There's more positive charges outside, more negative charges inside. So at rest, a neuron is polarized. That's just its normal state to be in. And then if we consider uh, ion channels opening, like we were talking about up here, when the cell opens some ion channels, what's going to happen is the membrane will become depolarized as ions flow down their electrochemical gradient. So we're gonna be talking about depolarization Okay, um, so that means that this value is changing. It's moving towards zero, um, so becoming depolarized. And then we will also encounter repolarization. So that's going to be involving the cell um, re-achieving this value for its membrane potential. So that could be accomplished by specific movement of ions. Maybe there would be some pumps that re-establish the normal resting um, conditions.
it is possible to have hyperpolarization. So if we move even more positive charges out of the cell than, than what's normal at rest, then we would say that the cell becomes hyperpolarized. So maybe our, rest, our membrane potential would be something more negative, even than minus 70. Maybe it would be like minus 90 or something. That would be called hyperpolarization. It is possible to physically measure the polarization state of a membrane. We can literally measure what is the difference in potential on the two sides of the membrane. So let's just go to the next slide and take a look at a, kind of a schematic of that. So here we have a neuron. Here is its axon. And what's being shown is just two tiny, tiny probes. One is sitting just outside of the cell and the other is poked just inside of the cell. So those are two electrodes. Those are the things that allow us to measure um, the difference in voltage between these two locations. So the nice thing about an instrument like this is that it can record data for us and we can actually make a, a time graph of how voltage changes over time. So on this graph, uh, tying this back into what we were just talking about on the previous slide, we've said that the resting membrane potential for neurons is minus 70. So that's right here where my laser pointer is parked. That's the resting membrane potential. And then when we talk about depolarization, so uh, we're gonna see this when specific ion channels open. With depolarization, what we're gonna be doing is moving up on this scale, so up towards, towards zero, essentially. So that's called depolarization. And then going in the other direction, this would be hyperpolarization. So those are those words that we just introduced, some terminology uh, just a second ago. Um, and, and here they are on the graph. <laughs> Generally when a neuron, when a cell is stimulated, so this is going to come up in the context of senses, right? If you, um, if you touch something and it feels hot, okay, the neuron that's being activated in that case, we, we would say that it's being stimulated and that stimulation causes depolarization. So this is generally how sensations will be sent is through depolarization. We're going to see how that happens very, very shortly here. Depolarization usually involves the movement of sodium ions, and specifically those sodium ions would be flooding into the cell, so causing the cell to be depolarized, literally. So moving up, um, up towards zero on this scale, that's depolarization. Hyperpolarization, going the other way, usually this involves the movement of potassium ions leaving the cell, so positive charge is being pumped out. Um, that's hyperpolarizing the, the membrane. Or we could also accomplish hyperpolarization by bringing more negative ions into the cell. And this might be a good spot to, to pause the video and just think about this. Make sure you're okay with understanding like where, where are these charges located? Um, make sure that it makes sense that Doing these two things would lead to hyperpolarization. This is something that's a little bit complicated, so good to just take your time going into it. And then what we're gonna do um, is look at some of the details of how these ion movements can happen.